Good afternoon and welcome to the Staffline Group PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. They can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just please simply type in your question at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. And this meeting is scheduled for around 30 minutes. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. And if you would give that your kind attention, I would be, and I'm sure the company would be, most grateful. And I'll now like to hand over to Daniel Quint, CFO, and Albert Ellis, CEO from Staffline. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you, uh, Mark. We're, we're now um, going to share with you some of the detail uh, following our trading statement last week. You, you, may, you might have seen that. I'm sure many of you did. And the context to this, this presentation is really to, to address and speak to those points that we, that we made in the statement. And uh, so it's not going to be a long update. And also we don't have the detail yet in the public domain around the divisions or around, um, around the specific components of, for example, gross profit. But in terms of the headline figures, we felt that due to the positivity that we feel and the confidence we have, and also the importance of our statement last week, we feel that it really deserves um, a, pre a short presentation and obviously the opportunity for Q&A. Uh, here, here's the topics we're going to be covering. Uh, this is in no way going to be a long presentation. So whilst there are six subsectors, uh, we're going to be moving through them pretty quickly. We're going to really spend some time, I think, <clears throat> particularly on the balance sheet, uh, where Daniel's got some really good, insightful background and detail. And of course, I'll be talking to the operational points that we made in the statement. So without any further ado, um, you know, you, you've seen, many of you have seen or acquainted with our new strategy and the vision for the company. Uh, the, the benefit we have is this staff line group has really retrained all the best of what was what made it a great company many years ago. And it is truly a world-class recruiter and training group. We are the clear market leader. We're benefiting from that market leadership in the UK. And my vision, my personal vision and my personal brand is to deliver a trusted partner status to the business so that instead of just delivering, I'm going out and I'm meeting um, clients, I'm meeting customers, I'm meeting senior individuals of directors of our customers and indeed stakeholders uh, within the public sector. Um, in, 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 this, in this regard, we're changing the market. We're changing the perception of the market about Starfline. Um, so first point is we're capitalizing on our market leadership. And, and we'll demonstrate how we're doing that. And the gross profit increase of 11% is a real testament to how we've grown our market share in real net fees, not just in revenue. We're going to broaden the portfolio, and, and we've done that. We, we've seen and we've reported on strong permanent, permanent revenues. And obviously, in Ireland, where we've got a white-collar recruitment business, a strong white-collar recruitment business, Just to um, continue. Yes, just one second. Would you mind just cutting in? I think we just lost uh, Albert. Just that's no, that's Thank no you. problem. That's no problem. Just to continue the uh, theme that Albert was talking about, and he's mentioned uh, there the the bottom, the final strategy in that component there regarding the Republic of Ireland. We have an extremely well established business in Northern Ireland, over twenty percent of market share. And just around two to two and a half percent market share in the Republic of Ireland. And we see a really fantastic opportunity to enlarge our, our footprint in, in Ireland. And we're going to be in, investing money there um, to uh, expand our presence in Republic of Ireland. So um, that really uh, encapsulates our strategy and vision and something we that uh, we feel is really very, very focused and allows us to to take the, the business forward very positively. I think Albert is now, now back with us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Mark. Sorry about that. Didn't have, don't have an idea of what, what was driving there. Um, looking at the highlights now, and this is we not. I'm not going to talk about the financials. Um, Daniel will talk about that. But let me just focus for a bit on the trading. Um, we the group really can continue to trade strongly across the second half of 2021, uh, building on the positive momentum we reported in the first half. And 
you know, we, we expected to, you know, hit virtually a billion dollars in terms of revenues, just shy of a billion dollars in terms of revenues, which is a real milestone for us. But we did this despite exiting a low margin contract, which was worth about 40, 48 million. So in terms of like for like, the revenue growth was still impressive. Underlying operating profit, obviously, you saw that it doubled. And then da Daniel's going to talk about the cash flows. Um, in terms of the recruitment business, uh, we saw high levels of worker fulfillment. And this is what our, our clients and our customers really expect of us, is to be able to use our reach and our scale to attract workers and to find deep pools of talent despite the worker shortage. And this was underpinned by the technology that we have where we're using technology to enable efficiencies and to you know, drive contacts with workers and enable shift patterns to be filled um, as quickly as possible electronically and, and from a digital point of view. Cross-selling into our blue-collar customers has been very successful. We'll talk about that next month at our final presentation um, in, on the 22nd of March that week when we, when we announce our, final, our finals. And we'll talk about how we enabled that cross-selling of permanent recruitment, which is a big strategic um, objective for us into our blue collar customers. In Ireland, um, you know, the, the businesses did very, very well despite the sort of restrictions. Ireland was experienced one of the most severe uh, restrictions in the world in terms of COVID. I'm talking about the Republic now, but also Northern Ireland has had, um, has had some severe restrictions. And that really held back the Irish business in the first half of last year. If you if you if you were with us then and you and you looked at those interims, you'd have seen Ireland was flat. I'm delighted to say in the second half of last year's restrictions were, were released, Ireland really bounced back. And we've got a great story in Ireland as we, we pivoted the business more towards permanent and we made a big difference in changing its margins and, and refreshing its appeal in the in the white collar sector and also um, in the permanent recruitment market. And then <clears throat> people plus. Well, you know, we had a deep restructuring of People Plus in, in 2020. We, 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 we you know, we, we disposed of the, the apprenticeships business and we rebuilt the business's core service of skills and employability. And, you know, I'm delighted to say that People Plus has really turned around in the last, um, in the last 12 months. And we, when we show you the results in March, you'll be able to see the stunning turnaround both in profits, but also in growth in underlying like-for-like -like growth. And I announced in June 2021 that People Plus had secured a number of restart contracts. Those have gone well. We've mobilized those contracts. We're in Kent, we're in Wales, and we're in the northeast of England. Um, and those those contracts are on track, and, and our business plan is, is, is looking um, accurate at this point, and we're very pleased with performance we've done so far. Um, so, you know, with, with that, 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 that's the sort of operational summary um, you, I've made some other points there in particular, you know, in those sub brands of drivers, um, Omega, which is, you know, recruit engineering recruitment and Datum, which is recruit recruitment process outsourcing. They all had a good year and built profits on last year. So increase their profits on the prior year. So with that, over to you, Daniel. Excellent. Thank you very much, Albert. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Excellent to be presenting to you again. Uh, last time was at half year in September. Um, and really great to be able to present to you the uh, full year 2021 financials at a high level. As Albert said at the beginning, um, these are currently unaudited and, and are provisional. And our, our full year official financials will be out on the 22nd of March. And we hope to still to be finalized to have an investor meet presentation on the 23rd of March, that will be a Wednesday. So um, I will just uh, give some extra flesh on the bones of the financials as were presented in the trading update, just published recently. Um, and for, for those of you who might not have been on the call back in September, just as a reminder, uh, revenue for us includes all the temporary worker salaries that go through that line. And therefore we very much see, in addition to revenue, very importantly is gross profit, as a real indication of the fees that we are delivering and, and charging to our, our customers and that we're earning. So really great to be able to present an 11% year over year increase in gross profit. And very importantly, 0.8 uh, percentage points of margin growth there to 8.8%. Additionally, uh, the next very important ratio is our conversion ratio, and that's the conversion from gross profit. What I just said was a real indication of, of how well we're performing. Conversion of that 
through to underlying operating profit. And that improved, um, again, on an unaudited estimated basis to 12.1%, um, over 6.4% in the prior year. And all that allowed us to more than double underlying operating profit from 4.8 million in 2020 to what is estimated at circa 10 million in 2021. So a really great performance after the challenges of the business uh, two, three, four years ago. Um, and that, that takes me through to the balance sheet. So at year end, we expect to be reporting a net cash number of 6.9 million, which is 15.7 million up on, on 2020. And that is despite repaying 40.7 million pounds worth of the 46 and a half million pounds of deferred VAT that we were allowed to defer by the government's COVID measures as implemented in 2020. And those that VAT has been paid back in eight installments between June 21 and the final installment was actually paid a week and a half ago of 5.8 million pounds on Monday, the 31st of January. So we now stand with no COVID liabilities or debts owed at all. Um, so a really great position uh, to be in. And of course, uh, that improvement was achieved most substantially through the support of the equity raise of so 46.4 million pounds net of costs that we uh, carried out in June 2021. But in addition to that, and we'll see that in a moment, improved trading cash flow and cash collections. There are some timings of, of 10 million, which might unwind, um, but just thought we'd give you a heads up on that. Um, but really a, a great position to end in as on a pre-FRS 16 basis. Um, although we do report IFRS 16, just making this like for like to previous years, and we'll gradually transition formally uh, to only reporting IFRS 16 in subsequent periods. In terms of just to carry on that point regarding the transformation of the balance sheet, what I've presented here is the last um, half year reporting points back to December 19. So you've got December 19, June 20, December 20, June 21, and then the most recently December 21. So you can see on the right hand side, the 6.9 million pound reported, but I've adjusted all these reporting points for two variables. The first is a an off balance sheet non recourse, legitimately off balance sheet non recourse receivable facility that the business has had for many years off balance sheet that we brought on balance sheet in June 21 when we refinanced the business last year. And what I've done is because it's on the balance sheet in the 12 in the December 21 column on the right hand side, I've added it on in the in the slightly darker shading uh, shaded number um, in in the previous year, in the previous periods. And that's the middle column over to the left hand side. And then additionally, I've also adjusted uh, in the reporting points when we had deferred VAT. So that's June 20, December 20, June 21. And then within the green column in December 21, You'll see I've commented there. There's a further 5.8 million. So the adjusted number at the year end is 1.1 million cash instead of 6.9. And what this allows me to do is present on a like for like basis, the half year and full year adjusted net debt numbers, bringing it in line with how we've reported numbers at December 21. And you can see net debt on an adjusted basis has moved from 85.2 million pounds in December 19 to 1.1 million pounds in December 21. So that is an 86.3 million pound improvement over that two year period, clearly significantly contributed to by the 46.4 million pounds equity raise, leaving another 40 million pounds of benefit. Well, where did that come from? Well, we know I've mentioned about 10 million pounds worth of timing, which could possibly most likely unwind. So that leaves you 30 million. And where that comes from is over the two year period, 10 million pounds worth of trading cash flow contribution. And then also really importantly, 20 million pounds worth of working capital, balance sheet tightening, cash collection, improvement, gen cash generation. Um, so a really great journey, both in terms of what was done from a corporate finance perspective in terms of the equity raise, but as importantly, if not more importantly, actually, the in-house work that my team have done, as well as the operational teams have done to really tighten the balance sheet and then, of course, deliver profit, as I mentioned, over that two year period. So um, really excellent to be able to um, report that position. Just as a reminder, um, the, this is the um, the current financing facilities that the group has. So it's not changed since June. But just as a reminder, um, that's a, you know, we've got a great 
set of financing uh, structures there, effectively a receivables facility of 90 million with an accordion of 15, um, a 15 million there. It's a four and a half year arrangement with a one year extension possibility, margin starting at 2.75%, reducing to 2% on, on Sonia when leverage drops below <clears throat> three times um, underlying EBITDA. And if you, if we can, if, you, if one sees the net debt or net cash position, we should be moving towards that position extremely rapidly. So that's uh, an excellent uh, position to be in. And now I'm going to hand back to Albert, who is uh, going to take you through some jobs market insight. Thank, thank you, Daniel. Um, so we, we just put out, pulled out some of the really current and important statistics, which is the backdrop to the recruitment market. And if any of you are investors or you like the sector, as I have you know, been in the sector for 30 years almost and um, invested in the sector for many of, for much of that time, you'll know that you know these stats, the, the payroll number of payroll employees, the hours worked and the job vacancies are probably your three most important um, statistics when in evaluating the market. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Firstly, payroll employees, it's at a record high. So this is for December. 2021, it shows that in the month, 200,000 employees were added to payrolls. And since the pandemic, we're up 400,000 in terms of payroll employees. Now, think about payroll as our market. Employees will move from job to job. The quicker they move, the more they resign, the more vacancies there are, the higher the velocity of the market. So tight labor markets benefit recruitment. And that's why the whole sector has benefited and, and has risen on the back of this. But also, we're comforted that whilst we've got, you know, almost 29, you know, 30 million payroll employees, our market continues to grow. Now, secondly, hours work. Now, this is really important to understand how it impacts us and other companies. First of all, much of our margin is charged on an hourly basis. So you can see that disappointingly, and this is, to the broader productivity challenge that COVID has, 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 has impacted in the market, is that the quarterly change is 2.6 million hours down. And the pre-pandemic um, levels were some 33.5 million higher than where we are today in the quarter, December to February. So hours worked is really important. So the problem is people aren't working the hours. And that's because there's a lot of, there's a lot of friction. There's isolation. There's the so-called pandemic. There's um, they're, they're sick. People are ill. People are taking time off, and so on and so forth. So hours worked is well below pre-pandemic levels. Now, one of the most important reasons it's low is because sectors haven't opened. So travel and manufacturing are two obvious ones. Um, aerospace, for example, that their, their manufacturing and supply chains are quiet, and of course. Um, uh, you, you've also got uh, travel. Now, some of those, some of those, some of those individuals or cohorts have actually been employed in the online market, in the distribution market. But essentially, we're having lower hours, and this means that when those sectors do open, and when they do, and the economically inactive individuals return to the marketplace, and the hours increase, so our gross profit will increase. And then finally, uh, job vacancies. Well, look, the, the sort of short answer on this is, you know, we've got unprecedented demand for labor. And that's because people are resigning, they're moving, um, they're creating job vacancies, and companies are growing. But companies are growing in a different way. We're seeing the online sector, we're seeing logistics sector, we're seeing the transport sector, really, you know, I think the latest stats on one of the big job boards was 500% up year on year. And then manufacturing and travel is more subdued, you know, much, much lower levels of growth. But essentially, we've got record uh, job vacancies, which means recruiters become very important in the supply chains of our customers. Now, finally, just to take you through the outlook, but perhaps to give you a little bit more color, you know, obviously, the company's developed an ex, it's, you know, delivered an excellent performance. We're very proud of it. Um, I don't, you know, we didn't have the visibility of exactly where we'd end up in the year. And Daniel being very, very cautious and also, you know, doing his job as CFO, wanted to nail those, the, those facts and the evidence and make sure that when we reported that we would report numbers that had been reviewed and thoroughly checked. So that's why we didn't report 
those numbers at the end of the year, but we waited for two weeks into January to three weeks into January, and we set out the results, including the cash position, which was well ahead of our expectations in the markets. Um, look, we've had three upgrades in the year, and um, and that's terrific. And we're hoping that this year, we, we're expecting, we've got the confidence that this year, we'll, we'll see the similar, you know, sort of momentum in the market. But we've got a better backdrop because we know, and with the Prime Minister just announcing in the last couple of hours, that he was bringing forward the um, the, co the, the relaxation of the rest of COVID re restrictions in England, and in particular, all the legal restrictions. So that should take away the last of the headwinds in t in, that relate to COVID, which is really important. Now, um, there's two there's two strong recruitment sectors, which 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 historically staff line have been really strong, and that's automotive. Um, and the travel sector. So automotive part of man manufacturing, you, you know what's happening there. You know, uh, secondhand cars are rising, new cars, are, you know, are, are not being delivered because of supply chain issues, shortage of chips, etc. And travel, of course, is obvious with all the challenges with testing in countries that have been, you know, that have not been open. Um, so we expect those sectors to really come back to life in the second half of this year. And that's why we're flagging it in the outlook that it should be a key drove, driver of growth in the second half of, our, of, of, of this year. And we've got anecdotal evidence to, um, to support that, that expectation. In addition, we've been really active on the business development front. And, um, you know, we, we'll, be, we'll, be very, we'll be very pleased to be able to update the market from time to time where we've, you know, secured a new contract or we've, um, we've, we've, we've further developed our, our, our revenue line in a way that, that, that would make sense. To, to, to make an announcement. So we're looking at all of those positives as, as underpinning the pipeline of the business. Um, and therefore, you know, that's, that's, the, that, that's, the, that, that's the confidence the board has in the growth prospects for the medium to long term. Uh, and the, one of the most important things we did, obviously, was recapitalize and refinance the group. Um, so now we have the balance sheet strength to move from an operational standpoint to a growth um, stance and uh, with the operational agility that we've now developed with the transformation, the deep transformation, we can now execute on more ambitious organic growth plans. Of course, we won't rule out M and A. You know, our cash flows are doing very well, but we're going to be cautious. But we, you know, bolt on acquisitions in the next three to five years is something that we'd certainly include on, on our menu. Um, but m for the next twelve months, it will be focused on um, organic growth. So with that, I mean, uh, Daniel, I think we're, we're, you're going to be just talking to the, the, the attendees on, on, on how we're actually reorganizing our investor communications so that people, people have a much and know where to find stuff um, and, 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 and be a lot more open with, um, with our communications. Yeah, thank you, Albert. Um, so, yeah, just to really just a final couple of uh, a moment or two on our investor relations website. Um, you'll be able to find that, of course, on our, our PLC corporate website. What we, we've upgraded it, um, and we've also provided an analyst research notes section. Um, there's an additional research firm who's been writing on Staffline, which is Zeus, and uh, one is able to access that note um, if you go through the analyst research note subsection. Um, there are additional notes on there. They've also done an interview, etc. You'll see on the front of that website just on the left of the slide there. You'll be able to click on that. Um, Albert also did uh, an interview uh, a week or two ago in terms of giving his perspective on the market, on the business, etc. So there's, there's some more information uh, for investors to be able to understand the business and the sector we operate within much further. So um, what we will now do is take some Q&A. That's great. Daniel, Albert, thank you Which, very much indeed for updating thanks, investors. Mark. No problem at all. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that recording this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Um, Albert and uh, Daniel, obviously investors submitted a couple of questions beforehand, which I know you've provided a written response to, which we will make available after today's meeting. Uh, but perhaps if I could hand back to you just to read out the questions received from investors today and give a response where it's appropriate to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. Yes, of course. Let, let me pick up. And thank you for There's quite a few questions, which we will try and get through them. Um, so give brief but 
detailed answers if we can. The business has undergone deep transformation. This is from Oliver, which has resulted in excellent results, the stronger balance sheet and the pipeline of opportunity for growth. However, it's yet to be reflected in the current share price at 55p. You ask, do we foresee a risk that the company could be an acquisition target before its true value is recognized? Well, first of all, um, all public companies are, are targets, if you like. They certainly are, um, a, you know, they, 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 the, the system is such that if someone wants to acquire a company, there's a, there's a, there's a set rule, there's a set, a set of rules and a way that that can happen in an orderly way. So as a public company, yes, we're, we're, we're always, if you like, up for sale in that sense. Someone, you know, anybody can, 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 can acquire the company should they persuade the board and shareholders in that direction. However, in our particular case, we, we agree that, um, you know, the share price seemed not to have responded to the results um, in the way that one would expect. And I can give you some assurance that I mean, having known the shareholders as I do, um, and, and the top shareholders are, you know, uh, HR Net, um, Andy Bruffett at Schroeder's, you've got um, Henry Spain, you've got uh, Aberdeen, you have uh, Gresham and others. These, these individuals and these funds know what the value that's in the company and so, you know, they, they, they would not be, you know, they would not be active if they didn't feel that there was value in the company. So I think you can, you can just take it from the fact that we've got strong shareholders who have a view about the value of the company um, that, that they would not allow uh, the, the company to, you know, to, to realize value, which, 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 you know, to not realize the true value. Um, then We've got uh, thanks there to the team um, for holding the call. So yes, thank you, thank you that 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 you acknowledge that we we really are going to make sure that we do as much as we can. You you asked about the disruption that took place for business with the NHS as a result of the vaccination mandates now reverse. Um, that doesn't affect us in the sense that we 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 don't actually supply the NHS as materially um and and you know all the care sector so it doesn't quite affect us but obviously with you know the logic behind the reversal being that the vaccination uh, that the the the, the omnicrom is you know resist you know still infects although obviously um doesn't is, is a milder version and doesn't result in the sort of death and and hospitalization the fact that that's happened i think means that the vaccination mandates were just simply you know, not logical in that sense. So, you know, I don't think it'll have any effect on our business. But what is really important is that the advent of the Omicron various being milder raises confidence and increases economic activity. And people will be will feel much more freer to go out and do their business. And that will mean that people will, you know, will, will, will be much will be much more accepting in terms of um joining our firm joining the uh joining our clients and and going and and, and going to work in the morning so mm -hmm. it's it's all about the fact that people have been sub uh that they've been isolating that's been a challenge um daniel maybe um uh, but you want me to take the next one? yes thank you yeah i'll take i'll take the next one so uh the question was asked it's great to see the improved financial discipline within the company no doubt helped by the fundraising. Are there any customer types struggling with payments and or difficult to deal with right now? Well, many of you will know that I focused the last two years while here in really tightening the balance sheet, implementing a, a very rigorous process in terms of assessing any credit risk with any customers. Um, I was just looking at the at the debtor books last week and actually, you know, they're, they're fantastically tight and, and clean. There's always uh, small bits and bobs and small uh, smaller customers that, that might be challenging. But actually, I would say we're at the cleanest and tightest we've been. And I would add to that, whenever we see any potential risk and looking at any particular sectors that might be struggling and particularly in companies, we keep a, a credit watch on companies, we would immediately ask for um, upfront payments or to make sure that our credit risk is absolutely mitigated. So in summary, in answer to the question, there isn't, um, you know, significant or material um, issues with struggling payments at the moment, which is which is a good position to be in. But we're always cautious and always keeping uh, trying to stay ahead of the curve on that. Albert. Thank you, Daniel. Um, you've asked if there's more to aim for in terms of permanent placements across the group. And if so, what sort of growth we might expect from this activity and in which key areas we really are seeing um, a swing to perm. We're seeing it across the board. It really is the way customers have decided they're going to retain their top talent 
even in the blue collar sort of um, market where customers would rather retain labor across the quieter periods of January and February um, and in advance of sort of the Easter holidays, et cetera, and the sort of mini summer peak, then lose that, that labor, which is something that I hadn't seen um, over the last couple of years until now. Um, th there's such a desperation to retain labor and to not suffer from a shortage of labor that customers are prepared to retain. And in so doing, they're very open to permanent recruitment. Um, so you can certainly expect to see us improving our, our exposure to PERM. And, you know, it's high margin, it's cash generative, it's 100% flow through to operating profit. In, in existing customers, it's just simply a no-brainer. Um, you've also asked if there are any missing services from the group portfolio, and if so, what um, what we're going to do. Look, the, 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 the there's no... Well, I, I can't see any app obvious holes. We've got recruitment process outsourcing. We have a white collar recruitment uh, sector offering right across the UK and Ireland. And we've got our strong blue collar. So we, we really are a complete generalist. We've even got an, an executive recruitment business in, in the Northern Ireland where we, we started, you know, looking at that market and we have a consultant who's heading it up and we're hiring into it. So we're, we're a true generalist in that sense, which was, which is our vision. Um, thanks for the great update. Well done on the certificate progress. What is your view on MA? I, I said that we certainly have a view that MA would be part of our growth story, but not in the immediate 12 months. Um, settling down driving that organic growth, making sure the balance sheet is is strong and continues to generate cash, you know, getting the foundation right. That That's our focus. Um, you've asked how operationally and financially centered the business is it incremental contract gains. Well, it depends if we, you know, if it's an, in, if it's a, if it's a service introduction on an existing contract. So for example, when we, you know, hire people permanently into a cardo, uh, Carter is an existing account, and so we're hiring people permanently into that business. Then th that is incremental. That's that's very sensitive and very highly incremental to our operating profit because we've already got sunk costs. When we look at a completely new service or a new customer, clearly we have to build out um, cost base and overhead, and that's less likely. However, what it does do is it provides it gives you synergies. So you get synergies by exploiting and and squeezing your overhead over a broader uh, client client base over a broader waterfall of, of customers, and therefore you get sort of I, I would call it in, you know indirect benefits as 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 you add those contracts. So growth has got many many attractions, um, not least of all um, the fact that you should be getting at least twenty percent of your additional GP flowing through to operating profit in in a normal market. So twenty twenty p in every pound of additional. Um, gross profit in a normal market, normalized business as usual, should be dropping down to the bottom line. And then uh, finally, what's the current debt position employing? Okay, so uh, maybe Daniel, you you want you want to just um, you just want to answer that one? I think in terms sure. of the IRS. No, nope. yeah, no problem at all. So um, in terms of the the debt position adjusted for for sixteen, we'll be reporting those formal numbers on the 22nd of March, but I can draw you to the half year and the year end accounts when, uh, which illustrates that there is probably a few million, no more than a few million uh, of additional recognized debt that is counted as a part of net debt post the IFRS 16 accounting adjustments. Um, of course, for companies such as a Tesco's or pub companies, et cetera, where there's vast amounts of, of leasehold properties, that will be quite substantial. Um, no one near as substantial for us. So but previous accounts have shown it's it's a few million and, and we, it won't be a million miles away from previous accounts um, when adding the leaseholds onto that. Um, with that, I don't think there are any further questions. Absolutely not, so, uh, Daniel Albert. Thank you very much indeed. You've answered every question from investors and thank you for all those that have taken time to submit questions and perfect timing as well. Um, uh, Daniel, Albert, I know investor feedback is important to you guys and I'll shortly redirect investors so they can provide you with their thoughts and expectations. But Albert, perhaps before doing so, I could just ask you for a few closing comments. Yes, thank you, Mark. First of all, I just wanted to answer a question that was raised on one of the bulletin boards and it seemed to have gained some traction. Um, and I just want to, because it's an important one, and that was, um, is the CEO going anywhere? Um, and I just wanted to say on the record that the, the, that rumour is certainly untrue and there's no, I have no intention of going anywhere. So any uncertainty as regards my sort of um, 
my, my appetite for new challenges uh, i'm s certainly wrong that my the challenge and staff line is, is 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 yet to really be fulfilled in its fullest form the value is yet to be realized in its fullest form so i'm super in, super motivated by that so just a quick question answer on that one but really to have achieved such a strong profit performance i think during the year during the second year of covid presented huge um uh you know headwinds that we were facing off to including the fact that we had to do a fundraise we had to refinance our balance sheet we had to bring in new banks we had to bring in new investors um and then to to, to double our operating profit and end the year in a cash position i think you know i'm delighted um so i just wanted to just say that that's uh that, that, that that's a real a really it's a real testament to the underlying strength of the market leading position of the company so thank you for, for for attending thank you for your time and we'll see you soon hopefully in march that's great daniel albert thank you very much indeed for updating investors could i please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you in order that you can provide the company with your thoughts and expectations via the feedback form this will only take a few moments to complete but i'm sure will be greatly valued by the company on behalf of the management team of staffline group plc would like to thank you for attending today's presentation good afternoon to you all